Welcome to Bogs and Biodiversity. As Karen said, my name is Nuala Madigan. I am representing the Irish Peatland Conservation Council today. I'm their Chief Executive Officer and we're based at the Bog of Allen Nature Centre in County Kildare. It's great to have this, um, you know, facility where we can all meet online because it's a fierce blustery day outside and while we don't like the rain that much, bogs in Ireland certainly love the rain. So a good day for a bog and biodiversity talk. Um, so who are the Irish Peatland Conservation Council? We're a national charity and our mission is to conserve a representative sample of Irish peatlands for people today and future generations to enjoy. 2022 is actually the 40th anniversary since our foundation in 1982 and our work includes peatland site conservation, species monitoring, peatland policy, research, education and awareness. Our longest running campaign is the Save the Bogs campaign and our work is guided by a series of peatland conservation action plans. Uh, in 2021, we published our peatlands and climate change 2030 action plan. But as we are indeed in a climate and biodiversity emergency, uh, we also should uh, read our uh, seventh action plan in conjunction with our sixth halting the loss of peatland biodiversity. Today's talk, I'm going to share with you uh, an introduction into peatlands uh, or boglands as we know them and what are they, uh, share some of their unique biodiversity and some of their quirky facts about our boglands. And I suppose then, um, while we are, as we said at the moment in Ireland, going through our citizens assembly and uh, developing a new national biodiversity plan, look at the status of peatlands and their biodiversity and where IPCC uh, see that uh, we can all help uh, to take action to see the conservation of a representative sample of these wonderful habitats and indeed uh, their biodiversity. So what is a bogland? Well, boglands are also known as peatlands, um, but we'd never say we're off down the peatland. We generally are off down the bog and they're wetlands, 90% water, 10% dead and decaying plants. And they covered over a million hectares in Ireland. Uh, in our island. Uh, they're acidic in nature. Um, a peat is the result of the accumulation of uh, dead plant material over thousands of years. What's unique about a bo the bogs is that they have a very high water table within around 20 centimetres of the surface and this inhibits the natural decomposers of bacteria and fungi that we would typically have in other landscapes and habitats around Ireland and this means that they're extremely nutrient poor environment and indeed a, a really important store of carbon. Healthy peatlands as I mentioned have a water table within about 20 centimetres and the main peat forming moss is known as sphagnum moss and uh, there's just this image here on the screen is of our sphagnum mosses as I said they're, they're known as our bog builders and they grow about a millimetre a year and store 10 times their own weight in, in water so as the talk progresses we will explore sphagnum a little bit more in detail. So where do we find boglands? This is a map of Ireland here on our screen. And uh, we'll look at our three main types of bog that we have in Ireland, our blanket bog, our raised bog and our fen. Um, and it's uh, although peatlands are not unique to Ireland, they're found in over about 180 different countries. They cover about 3% of our terrestrial land surface. Um, and although we have peatland maps that show that the most, uh, the majority of our peatlands would uh, be concentrated in the world and kind of our Northern hemisphere, you know, only in 2017, we found in the Cove Central Swamp Forest in the Congo Basin, one of the largest peatland complexes in the Southern hemisphere. Um, so when we look at it, uh, peatlands are significant globally, uh, but also uh, in Ireland, they cover 20% of our Irish landscape. So they're very significant on our small island here um, in uh, the Atlantic. So the, what are the types of peatlands? Well, we have fen. This is an image of Pollardstown fen in County Kildare. It's one of the most well-known fens. Uh, fens are alkaline in nature, so slightly different from our acidic uh, raised and blanket bogs, uh, typically forming in shallow basins, and they tend to have a continuous flow of water into them. So for example, Pollardstown fen has not grown into a raised bog because it has this uh, supply of ground-rich water coming in from the Curra aquifer, uh, and it emerges and about 40 springs around uh uh, around the, the fen itself. Then of course we have our raised bogs. These are concentrated in the Midlands of Ireland, the Lower Ban Valley in Northern Ireland, but it doesn't mean that you're not gonna find a raised bog in County Kerry, of course you can. So they, they form from shallow basins again, but the difference between these and fens is they typically didn't have um, a, a, a continuous flow of water. So they continued their growth into what we know today as raised bogs. And very open landscape, 
leaves, as you can see, all the plants low growing. This is due to both, I suppose, the acidic nature and the nutrient poor environment, but a very high water table and dominant carpet of sphagnum mosses uh, across the surface. We then have our blanket bogs, and these are typically found in our mountainous areas. We have Atlantic blanket bog that's uh, found up to about 200 uh, meters above sea level. And of course, then we have our mountain blanket bog, which is a found, a found above 200 meters. And these are typically uh, found, our blanket bogs, as I said, down along the Western seaboard. Uh, of course, we have our Schlieve Blue Mountains in, in our Midlands. And of course, we do have then uh, the Wicklow National Park. Uh, so they're not confined to the West, um, but they are are dominant uh, down along our, our wild westland uh, westerly uh, coastline there. So why are peatlands important? Well, traditionally peatlands were only valued for the peat within them, um, but today we know so much more about the values of Irish peatlands, and these are referred to as the ecosystem services. That's the benefits we all obtain from nature, and uh, the diversity of peatland ecosystem services I share with you now. Uh, why we're here and why we're discussing peatlands or boglands today is, of course, they're a rich and diverse habitat for biodiversity, and in a few minutes we'll go through some of those really special boglands plants that you typically don't find on other habitats on our island. They're a really important source uh, of, uh, of water regulation. Peatlands absorb um, rainwater and this is through the sphagnum mosses. This helps to prevent flooding and then they slowly release uh, the water to replenish our water resources um, further down uh, in our communities and our waterways. Uh, so really important for water storage and this is because the sphagnum mosses have this ability to store over 10 times their own weight in water. They're of course a carbon store. Uh, the peatlands contain approximately 64% of Ireland's soil organic carbon. So really important in terms of our um, supporting our climate mitigation plans and the Irish Peatland Conservation Council see our peatlands as a natural solution um, to uh, tackling our climate emergency. They're of course a source of food, not many people would um, typically go today, but traditionally cranberries and bilberries were harvested in our boglands. In, in the autumn time, recreational opportunities uh, so important, and I think we saw that following our, our COVID nineteen that there was more people uh, kind of you know, escaping our urban environment and going out into our upland areas. But really important for recreation uh, opportunities for members of the public, and uh, they're an inspiration to artists and poets. Uh, Seamus Heaney, one of our former uh, patrons, described our boglands as our unfenced country, and of course they are an economic resource as well. Uh, you might be familiar that we've used them and still use them in many homes as a fuel um, known as turf. So once we harvest the peat and cut it into sods, it's referred to as turf. Uh, we traditionally used it as electricity generation. We would have had about eight peat burning power stations around the country. Uh, most of these now have closed, but we still do burn partial peat in our Eden Dairy power station. And then of course they are also used in the horticultural industry for germinating seedlings and growing um, ornamental plants. And finally, they are a land bank for agriculture and forestry. So many uh, farming communities using our boglands for grazing uh, their livestock. And indeed, uh, we might be familiar that we have um, uh, the use of our peatlands as, as a forest uh, for the plantation of forestries. Quilcher, one of our state forestry agencies, actually owns one of the, the largest uh, store of bogland in Ireland, I believe up to 200,000 hectares of bogland. Um, so uh, they have many values. Today, um, what we're going to focus on, though, is the biodiversity element uh, of our peatlands and why they're important for biodiversity and how they can support halting the loss of bio biodiversity in Ireland. So, as I mentioned, I was going to come back to these sphagnum mosses. Uh, we wouldn't have our boglands if it wasn't for these sphagnum mosses. We have approximately about 30 of them in Ireland. They come in all colours um, from greens to reds to browns and yellows and uh, what's interesting about the sphagnum mosses is they're actually only alive at the tip so what we see on the surface there is the living part known as the head and then everything beneath that is what's ultimately dying and what's forming peat they have these side lateral arms on them and these interlock with other sphagnum mosses and this is what helps them to store water externally but then internally in their body they have these really special cells known as high highline cells and and they also um, store water internally and that's what makes them so good at being water stores and uh, really important for water storage. 
they also have a really special ion exchange. So if anyone did chemistry in school, uh, they, the sphagnum mosses um, absorb water, which we know the elements are H2, um, H2O. Uh, so the oxygen is good for them, but they don't really necessarily need a, all that hydrogen. So what they do is they pump out these hydrogen ions into the bog. This typically then lowers the pH of the bog, and then they swap those for any kind of calcium or any other nutrients, NP and K, it can get from the surface of the bog. And actually, the result of this means that you're never going to find a snail on the on a bog land because there is no calcium there for them to build their shells. So the plants are on the bog land are all interacting within this ecosystem, and and that affects what we find on bog lands. We also have our lichens. These are a symbiotic relationship. These are some of the classic ones that you'll typically find on bog lands from our matchstick. They have this red blob of flower. Um, you have um, the cup lichen in the centre and our, our reindeer lichen there on the right. And just an overview of how you might find that there within our bogland nestled in amongst the heather plant. This is a symbiotic relationship. So that means that it, it's two organisms that have come together, uh, an algae and a fungi, and that they formed a partnership because remember bogs are nutrient poor. So they have to come up with these ways to live on a bog. So sphagnum mosses have got this ion exchange, so they're grabbing whatever kind of nutrients they can by pumping out hydrogen and swapping them. Lichens, on the other hand, have decided to form a partnership together uh, where the algae will photosynthesize, but they can only do that when the fungi element of the relationship brings the water and is kind of the gatherer, and they both benefit then from the, the glucose that, that is made. Other interesting plants in the bogs would be our insect eating plants. And I put here native and non-native uh, because on the left of our screen, we have our pitcher plants. These are native to Ireland and they have been introduced. Um, and one of the management practices we would recommend is if you find these on a bog land, it's, it's to remove them because as we know with um, invasive or non-native species, they compete very successfully with our native ones, changing the, um, changing the, the biodiversity element on our, on our peatlands. So management would be to to remove these uh, from a site but of course we then do have our central one there the round leaf sundew and then of course we have our butterworth there is bladderworth as well which is found in water wetlands around Ireland as well and we have a long leaf sundew but just to give you some examples these are these are uh, unique in that because again they're living in a nutrient poor environment they've decided to trap and eat insects uh, to get uh, to kind of get more nutrients for themselves so that they can do in their very short life cycle produce a flower and, and reproduce so the sundew in the center here you can see it's got these tentacles each of these has like a sticky a, a little blob of glue this allows them to trap insects and then the leaf surface slowly curls up so it can create a tummy and through the stomata then they can release digestive juices absorb the nutrients they can and then um, uncurl and the remains will blow away in the wind butterworth has a very kind of leaf a uh, bright green leaf very close you can just barely see it in the picture there uh, but very leaf uh, close to the bogland surface and uh, their leaf surface then it, it's sticky so as spiders or ants walk across across the leaf surface they they get their feet stick stuck i should say so they also use uh, glue to trap and eat their insects but again really special plants and, and very specific adaptations to live in this nutrient and, and wet environment then we have our nitrogen fixers. Uh, on the left, we have the beautiful yellow star-shaped flower of bog asphodel. At this time of year, if you're out in the bog, uh, the seed heads will be there. They'll be this bright orange color. And on the right, then we have our bog myrtle. Uh, both of these plants, as I said, they kind of form a partnership with a rhizomium bacteria. This bacteria in nature can fix our atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into a usable form for plants. But to achieve that, they need a host plant. So both bog myrtle and our bog asphodel on our bog lands have kind of given up their roots to the rhizomium bacteria and in return for that they get the fixed nitrogen so it can support them to live on this nutrient uh, poor environment. Interestingly, with, with the plants on bog lands, we're, we're learning a lot about them. Bog myrtle is currently being used, uh, not being used at the moment, but research is ongoing in Trinity uh, under a project called NatPro, where they're looking at the oils from um, bog myrtle to see is it kind of a natural kind of pesticide? Because if you were out on a bog, and we know on bog lands in the summertime, there can be lots of little midges that can be annoying our, our, ourselves, biting our foreheads. Uh, bog myrtle is a natural kind of, an, a kind of insecticide that you can rub um, on your kind of skin just to kind of deter the insects from attacking you while you're out in the bog in the long summer evenings. 
And then of course we have our sedges. Sedges are very typical on boglands because sedges prefer wetter ground and boglands certainly uh, provide the wet ground for them. So we've got our, of course, our iconic bog cottons, many headed and a single headed bog cotton. On the very left of the screen, as I look at it, I'm seeing the white beak sedge and the deer sedge in the center beside the single headed bog cotton. And um, interestingly, the many headed bog cotton here is we know it as the snorkeler out in the bog. It's actually the deepest rooting plant on a bog because it has these internal air tubes running from the tip of the leaf right into the roots of the plant. So it can root down to 50 centimeters because it has this snorkel ultimately where it can kind of search for nutrients that no other plant can look for. All the majority of the other uh, peatland plants, they're very shallow rooting plants because there's no oxygen beneath the peat surface. We know this is important to store the carbon because uh, decomposition can't happen, but also it limits how the plants can live on our peatland habitat. Um, cotton was traditionally used to, to spin for thread or uh, for people to pick to, make, to stuff pillows with or for bedding years ago. Traditionally, we would have used feathers, but if you were allergic to feathers, you weren't going to get a good night's sleep uh, on those. Then we look at our heather plants. Um, again, very dominant, beautiful colors brought to our boglands in our in the, uh, the autumn time. They're one of our late sources, uh, sorry, the late flowers. So in terms of this, they're really important as a late source of nectar for our pollinators in our community. Uh, we've got our ling heather. Uh, traditionally, that's the one on the left there. That uh, was traditionally used uh, to make a sweeping brush actually in Ireland. Uh, we have then our crossley teeth in the center and our bell heather on the right. You tell the difference between these two, uh, the crossley teeth and the bell heather, they've got very similar flowers on them. But how you tell the difference in the field with these uh, is if you look at the uh, crossley teeth in the center, it's it's four leaves arranged in a whirl around the stem. So when you look down at it, it looks like a cross. Whereas if you look at the, excuse me, the um, bell heather, it has only three leaves arranged in a whirl. So that's a, a, an easy way to identify between them. Uh, these plants are interesting because even though they're living in one of the wettest natural terrestrial landscapes we have, they're actually got designs to live on a desert rather than a bogland. They have very shallow roots and they actually are one of the few plants on our boglands that don't actually hibernate in the winter and they don't hibernate because they're not going to freeze. They have, uh, they store very little water in the body of the plant. So when you touch it, they're very dry plants um, and that's because they, um, they, they, they kind of can photosynthesize all year round. So they're also the tallest plant often on a bogland because they don't have to begin their growth every year. Very small leaves in the summertime, this helps them to minimize water loss from transpiration. And um, yeah, just a, a really fantastic plant to have on a bog, so many values. And as I said, we even found our own values for them, as I said, making a sweeping brush years ago. But it's not only bogland plants that we're going to focus on today and I want to share with you some of our uh, really iconic kind of bogland animals uh, because biodiversity isn't just plants it's also animals um, and of course we're also part of Ireland's biodiversity so I've picked a few here uh, by no means again what I've showed you in terms of the plants or what I'm going to show you in terms of the animals are all that we have on boglands but it's just to give you an example of some of them so I've picked the butterfly here is the large heath butterfly I have specifically picked this butterfly and um, even though we know there's many butterflies that will get an extra source from our boglands this particular large heath is is a what we know is a raised bog specialist. It um, feeds on the cross leaved heath out on our bog lands. So we don't typically find it in any other habitat. Uh, at the moment, we're really kind of unsure of the populations of this large heath. However, uh, one of the things that we can all do to really support our biodiversity is become citizen scientists. And the National Biodiversity Data Center have a large heath habitat assessment and um, uh, citizen science program so it is something that if you're interested in you could get involved with the next summer it's a very short survey because they come out in the survey the assessment is completed in June and then they're on the wing for such a short amount of time for six weeks uh, so just an hour a week go out and see what large heats you can count and that can really support us to better understand um, you know what is the populations of this particular butterfly in Ireland and we know butterflies are biological indicators of our environment quality so uh, a really uh, you know really special uh, raised bog specialist 
Directly underneath that is our curlew. Um, I think this is one of the most uh, well-known uh, bogland birds, this long curled beak. I do have to say though, not specific um, to boglands as they, they don't live on our boglands in the winter. If you want to find a curlew at this time of year, they've all gone to the coastal areas. Uh, because of course our boglands freeze, the curlew is a very smart bird. It's decided that it doesn't want to live on the bog during the winter time because their beak won't be able to probe into the frozen pools or soft peat. So at this time of year, they're around the coastal areas and then they come inland to our boglands. Uh, at this time of year, they're also joined by migratory birds coming in. So populations do increase in Ireland in the winter time, uh, but it's the summertime when it's the Irish native breeding curlew that comes inland. And I believe we're down to about 122 breeding pairs of this bird. That marks a 98% decline since the 1980s. Um, so a really iconic bogland bird that's really struggling. In the center there, we have our red grouse. You also might know it as the heather hen. And um, this is again, another iconic bogland uh, bird. Uh, actually, interestingly, we've, uh, the National Parks and Wildlife Service have been undertaking over the past uh, year or two, um, a red grouse survey. So we'll hopefully get more data on the populations of this bird, but a very typical uh, and iconic bogland bird. And again, specific to peatlands in its food plants are these heather plants out in the bog. Beneath it, we have the one of the largest spiders in Ireland, our raft spider. On many occasions, I have found those with groups of students. They don't seem to be bothered by them. I'm not too keen on spiders, so I always keep a, a good distance away from them. But uh, again, just a spectacular um, a spider that we have on our on our wetlands in Ireland that can hunt uh, very stealthily over our bog pools and catch in search of their prey. Of course, our hare. Uh, again, uh, interestingly, you know the hare is adapted to live uh, not specific, I should say, to boglands. We will find hares in other habitats. But why I've included the hare is you're never ever going to find a rabbit or a badger on a bog because they can't burrow. If you dig a hole in a bog, you're a hole is going to fill up with your burr is going to fill up with water so hares are you know specific in that they can live on boglands because their whole adaptation is not to burrow so a rich support is supply of uh, bogland uh, uh, plants for them to feed on out on our boglands and of course they can nestle in amongst the sphagnumy and heather hummocks that are drier to give them a good shelter Below the, the hair then we have another raised bog specialist. It's actually the black dart or dragonfly. Uh, you know, dragonflies, um, they lay their eggs in water. They lay, uh, they leave their, their young develop underwater and they live there for about three years before they, they kind of climb up onto the bank side vegetation and become these darting dragonflies that we see around our communities. Any wetland, you know, a canal, a river, a lake, a garden pond, um, and indeed our bogland, we'll find these fantastic flying invertebrates. What's interesting about them is of all of the known invertebrates in the world, we believe the dragonflies are the only ones that can actually catch their prey in flight. So they're very carnivorous out in the bog. Uh, but the, um, the black darter is a specific to our bogland. Uh, so again, just to show you really to highlight the, the importance of our boglands for the, these specific species. And beneath that again, another uh, classic kind of bogland uh, invertebrate, the emperor moth two big eyes on its wings uh, but these are known as false face in nature they are designed to uh, kind of trick predators if i'm a buzzard going over the bog looking for a nice tasty meal and i see these giant eyes peering out at me i think it might be a bit much trouble to go attacking that for a lunchtime meal uh, when in fact what they're looking at is just the false face on the emperor moth their caterpillar is beautiful bright green and they're also feeding on heather out in our bogland so again, just a flavor of what you will find in our boglands. And what I wanted to show is that these animals and you know the, the plants that you find, the very specific adaptations to this acidic, nutrient poor, open uh, landscape, they've really uh, developed over time to really be these specialists out in the bogs. So are boglands important for biodiversity? Well, first off, we know about 20% or a fifth of our landscape is covered in peatlands. So it is a significant landscape that we have in Ireland. We also know about 15% of the original flora of Ireland are peatland plants. 
14% or about 59 species of Irish bird occur in peatlands and most are of breeding species. 26% of Ireland's mammals are dependent on peatlands in some phase of their life cycle. Um, and then 65% of Ireland's butterfly species are found on peatlands with two really specific ones being that breed on bogs as the, the large heath that you saw the image of earlier on and another then the green hair streak. So are peatlands important for biodiversity? Uh, the Irish Peatland Conservation Council answer is absolutely yes. So what's the status then of our peatland biodiversity or bogland biodiversity? So first off, I, you know, I want to say that, you know, overall, not, not just including boglands, but overall in Ireland, only about 10% of Ireland's biodiversity has been assessed. Um, so we don't know, you know, are these figures completely accurate because we haven't really assessed the overall status of our biodiversity so lots of work needs to happen there but what we do know about in terms of peatlands is 75 percent of our peatland habitat has been mined or drained and that means that less than one percent remain active what i mean by that human activities have altered the natural structure of our peatland habitats they are designed to be wet environments, acidic and nutrient poor. When you mine or drain and then mine a bog, you take the living layer off, you lower the water table, oxygen can get into the peat and decomposition can happen. So with that, you're altering the, uh, the, the natural, um, I suppose, Sorry, I don't know how to say this now, but the, the natural kind of setup of a bogland, um, the natural features of a bogland that the biodiversity has specifically adapted to, and you're you're altering that. Um, so the peatland plants then have to change or are lost as a result. With and as I said, only one percent are active, and this comes back to the sphagnum mosses. These are the active component. They they're what are actively forming our boglands. So according to then the EU status of um, uh, Ireland's, uh, under the, we report to the EU on the status of our, our, all our habitats under the Habitats Directive. And according to the 2019 Irish version, we have our raised bog, so that's active, their status is bad. We have our degraded raised bog, these are ones that have been drained in some way, they're considered bad. bad. We then have blanket bog, they're considered bad, and transition mire, are also considered bad. So of our bogland habitats, their status is bad. You'll notice I haven't mentioned fen here um, because we're actually, the National Parks and Wildlife Service are doing a national fen inventory at the moment. So we should have a clear, better picture of the status of our fens in the coming years. Um, and that's something that the Irish Peatland Conservation Council campaigned for many years to actually get a proper inventory of, of our fen habitats in Ireland. And we're delighted that, that that's taking place uh, as we speak. So overall, the status is bad. Ultimately, within biodiversity, uh, if we look at it, we're part of our biodiversity and we need some we need certain things and that's food and shelter. If our habitats, uh, if our bogland habitats aren't in a healthy state, that is naturally going to have an effect on the, uh, the biodiversity that call them home. So what we do know, as I said, understanding that not of all the biodiversity has been assessed, that about 26 or 6% of, or eight of the bog forming mosses are in Ireland's red lists. 44% or 26 of our peatland birds are on Ireland's red list. And I mentioned there to you already, just the status of the curlew, um, the 98% decline. And we know about 19.6% of peatland plants are on our red list. So we know that these are on it, but as I said, we have no idea about the large heath, what the status of that is. We're only doing a red grouse survey now, so we'll find out the status of that. So there's a lot more to learn about the status of our biodiversity, but overall, is it, is it in a healthy state? And, and the answer to that is, is, is what we're finding is no at the moment. So the question then is, is it too late to halt Ireland's biodiversity loss or peatland biodiversity loss? And, and the Irish Peatland Conservation Council is answer to that is no, it certainly is not. We would see first off is the protection and designation of sites is central to this. In 2017, Ireland went about redesignating our natural peatland, natural heritage areas. And they, in 2022, they're formally not designated yet. So we haven't really formally decided, you know, or legally decided what is going to be designated as a peatland NHA and what is not no longer going to be designated in a peatland NHA, even though this work happened over five years ago. 
The good news is, thanks to peatland research, which started back in the 80s and late 70s, it started with the Dutch first coming to Ireland when they were the first country in Europe to completely develop their bogs, have this overwhelming sense of loss that they took action as a country and wanted to learn about bogs and how they could help restore and rehabilitate their last 8,000 hectares. Um, and, and the Dutch, um, you know, we would say are, are really responsible for gearing up and getting the conversation started about peatland conservation in Ireland all those 40 years ago. And what we have is that we now, thanks to this research, and that's ongoing research, that the students in university levels in doing bachelor degrees, master degrees, and PhD studies, all on peatlands today. And this research is so important because we now know what we need to do to our boglands. They need to be restored and they need to be rehabilitated. You'll hear these words speak because restoration is where we take a, um, a, a bogland that may have been drained, but has its complement of plants on it, where we can maybe do some drain blocking. And after we do this restoration, we will be hoping to either increase active peat forming formation on that bog. Rehabilitation is a, is a slightly different term for a bogland rest, uh, well, re-wetting, I should call it, not restoration, but rehabilitation is where we have mined the boglands. We might have areas of uh, bare peat, and with that, they're drained, uh, they might no longer be acidic in nature, but they're still um, you know, an important area where we can encourage biodiversity back in, where we can lock carbon back into this peat habitat. And in that case, as we go through a rehabilitation where we can block drains um, using a, a number of methods today, we won't get active peat formation as we know it with the sphagnum uh, moss growing um, and, and forming our bog, our bogs, uh, but we will get maybe this kind of initial fen habitat that started to build our bogs uh, over 10,000 years ago. We also need to carry out a complete inventory in terms of peatland biodiversity. We really need to know where we are with it. And I think that's just not solely with peatlands, but you know, across Ireland in terms of our biodiversity. And that's where we all come in. We can all be citizen science. We have the National Biodiversity Data Centre. And each one of us, when we see a, a biodiversity in our communities, we can get involved by simply logging onto their website and recording that biodiversity, where we saw it, whether it be a plant, an animal, bird, whatever it might be but it's one of the simplest things that each one of us can do uh, right now. We need to encourage landowners. 69% of our peatlands are um, in private ownership. So we need to engage with landowners um, into the active protection of peatland biodiversity. And this has to be through kind of adequately funded national schemes. We see the One Life Project, which is a nine-year project in the West on blanket bog habitat, and it's taking a kind of a newer approach to peatlands where we're gi giving the kind of, um, you know, the parents, the farmers, uh, or the landowners, um, or the peatland custodians, whatever term we want to describe uh, those individuals as, but these are the people who are out there every day on our, on our bog lands. And um, what this scheme is doing is it's allowing them to assess their habitat with the support of advisors and then based on what work they uh, would like to do where they identify an invasive species may they identify a drain may they identify a forest station the work that they do then can fund um, their fund uh, support them in, in managing this land for biodiversity also we need to raise awareness and um, you know and this is something that this these talks this series of webinars are doing which are so important is we have to have these conversations around peatland biodiversity and we have to provide education materials and um, you know you might think you know as we get older we've all heard it before but interesting we have to think is there's the next generation coming behind us that need to learn of the importance of peatlands and how culturally and both you know as a natural a natural heritage and cultural heritage are are interlinked together. And then we also need, in terms of our government, we need an integrated peatland uh, biodiversity approach. The thing with peatlands is they cross government departments. They are within the, the Department of Agriculture because we have landowners that are farming this landscape. They are in our departments of, of heritage because they're part of our natural heritage. You know, we have road networks being built and often these affect our peatlands. So we have the Department of, of Transport. They're in energy. So we, we have to look at our energy department. So we need to have a joined up thinking when it comes to halting the loss of biodiversity, and particularly on peatlands. It's not going to be one department or one area that we can focus on it has to be kind of an overall approach to looking at peatlands and how we're going to manage them 
Now, after all of that, I would like to thank you for taking time out this lunchtime um, to learn about peatlands. What I wanted to share is that peatlands are home to many wonderful um, bogland plants and animals. Um, often they're unique um, ways to live on a bog. They're just fascinating, so they are. And it is truly a landscape that is very much part of Irish people and indeed our land. Uh, you can keep in touch with the Irish Peatland Conservation through our website, um, our email. If you want to read our peatland conservation action plans they are available on our website ipcc.ie and of course we're on social media so you can join us over there and we can keep you up to date on the work we're doing but for now i'll hand you back to karen and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon thanks so much Nuna. um so what i'm going to do is um hand it over uh to uh to uh, you the participants to go ahead and raise any comments or questions that you might have for Nuna. Um, one of them is the first one, brilliant talk. Thanks, Nuna. Um, that's nice to hear, really good feedback. Uh, so I'm in the questions and answers. Okay, so do we know the gen genetic diversity that exists in sphagnum moss populations across Irish peatlands? Has there been any population genomic analysis done on the remaining curlew? I am an Irish genomicist. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, working for the NIH in the USA at the moment, but I am a director of the European Reference Genome Atlas and would love to think about centralizing conservation genomics efforts in Ireland. What an interesting question. It is interesting. And to be honest with you, there's always a question that no one can answer. And that's me today. You've asked that question. I actually don't know what studies have been done. Uh, we know about sphagnum that, you know, we've used them right back into, they were recognized right back in World War I, that they could be uh, used as a wound dressing. I understand that companies have done research on them for their infection control qualities, qualities and that, and that, and that. Um, testing has been done uh, but indeed if there's anyone here present today that would have a better knowledge of that uh, please share it in the chat but unfortunately I don't know the answer apologies we can look at it I can look look into it afterwards you know and maybe contact a, a few people in our own universities and see what happens okay thanks so much Nina. are there any other questions that folks might have Um, Millie. Let me see. I think I have to allow you to go ahead and. Okay. Millie. Millie. Hi. Hi. How are you? Thanks very much for that talk. That was lovely. Um, I'm in the southwest of Ireland and I have about 15 acres of, of land up in the mountains and about maybe eight acres are about blanket bog with about one acre of uncut blanket bog. But um, I'm fighting with agricultural experiences and, and making money and all that crack. So over the years, I've never really touched any of it. I've kind of let it do what it needs to be doing. Um, but I'm finding as I'm getting older, it's harder and harder to do the work without getting paid for it. It's like a really expensive hobby. Um, is there anybody who would be willing out to come out to the bog and kind of assess what's there and what needs to be done in order to make it better for nature and all that? Or am I still fighting a battle on my own? So in, in are you involved in any of the agricultural schemes? I know the new acres scheme, um, that is similar to what I mentioned in the one life scheme where there's going to be a series of habitat assessments done on our peatlands and based on that and the work that we do, payments will be given. And my understanding is the new acres scheme, which is going to be rolled out over 20,000 farmers and landowners uh, next year from the 1st of January is based on this scheme. Um, so that would be kind of what I'd probably look at, look at your local Chagas advice and see what's happening there. Uh, I'm not too familiar with it. I'm not a landowner in terms of a, an agricultural landowner myself, so I don't know too much uh, about it, but maybe talking to your local Chagas advisor and seeing what, what is there uh, for you to uh, in support of that. Um, yeah, I, I will be doing that anyway. Um, I have always just found that no matter what green scheme within the agricultural department I've been part of, I've always kind of had to bend the rules or pretend that I didn't see them in order to actually do what's right by the bog or, or biodiversity. So I don't know, I'm kind of wondering whether I'm better off 
doing something um, more in geotourism or something like that in order to make money because um, it's always weighing up, do you know, am I making it worse for nature by introducing people into the area or am I worse for nature by introducing my animals into it? So it's, <laughs> it's a hard one. But anyway, I'll, I'll be talking to them about the acre scheme anyway. Good stuff. Um, thanks, Millie. So there's a few questions coming in on the Q&A function. Um, what is the future of our one remaining peat burning power station? Is it being supplied by turf only from Ireland or are we importing turf to supply it also? My understanding is that the uh, peat burning power station, which is operated by Board Namona, uh, Board Namona made a commitment to no longer um, harvest peat from their bog lands. So my understanding is what they're doing at the moment is they're using up supplies that were already kind of stocked with it. And then they're using uh, biomass within the peat burning so it's a partial peat burning station and i know the license for that is coming up in the next year or two so it should be fully moved from peat uh, very sh in the next year or two and that so i don't believe that there's peat coming in to be burnt in this country uh, we have heard the headlines about peat coming in for the horticultural industry um and they, this industry is it, it's going to be in a transition uh, we know peatlands are, are non-renewable and um, so the peat is a finite resource and we have to move towards a, an alternative, a peat-free alternative. Um, I know the, the Irish Peatland Conservation Council set on the peat use and horticulture um, review last year. We were disappointed with the outcome that there wasn't far <laughs> from, the, um, from the industry in terms of dates. We understand that, you know, it can't happen overnight, but it would have been great to have firm commitments. But in the UK, they are, from 2025, they're banning um, peat in the amateur garden market. And if each one of us go out and have a look, uh, we can buy peat moss compost for just planting up our flower beds in our garden, which it was just unnecessary. So again, if I was saying one thing to, to if you want to take action today for peatlands, is uh, don't buy peat moss compost in your garden centre. Um, as the, the industry transition, and they, they are transitioning, they're, they're, they're reducing their peat content, and, and that's going to take time. Uh, and they have got supports from the government through the peat use and horticultural working group uh, but each one of us as an amateur gardener we can make the choice we can compost at home um, and we can also choose peat free in our gardens yes there's sometimes a little bit more expense in choosing peat free but i know um some of the uh, you know uh, shopping centers or the, the the supermarkets they also do fantastic value peat free products and um, so that's what i'd kind of say in terms of peat Thanks, Mula. A couple more questions coming in on the Q&A function. Uh, one from Una. Can peatland conservation be carried out successfully while wind farms, solar farms and forestry plantations all continue to be developed on bar? Yeah, so it is something that, you know, IPCC are, are looking at. We would see that there should be no, um, you know, no kind of development on our wild boglands that we do have. Remember, not all our boglands are, are lost, 25% we consider in a conservation worthy state. And this is some of the work that the Irish Peatland Conservation Council do is monitoring what planning applications, monitoring scoping documents that come into um, our headquarters at the Bogavala Nature Centre and making um, you know, recommendations and decisions. We would see that no forestry company should plant on pristine bog, no uh, wind farms should be developed on pristine bog and in, indeed having a buffer zone around those. There are though, when we look at it, some of our uh, boglands that have been altered uh, to an extent that, you know, they won't be a bogland again. So we see this with industrial peatland uh, where it would never be what we know as an active bogland in our lifetime. Um, and in those areas, there have been plans um, and there has been developments on boglands. Um, but again, this is something that we have to be, it, 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 it's, again, it's looking at a balance. I think that's really important when we look at this from a peatland point of view, because uh, we can't protect all the boglands. That, 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 that day is gone, but we do have a, a good portion of boglands that we can take action for today. And these are the, the boglands that we have, the 25% that we can conserve. And these are the ones that we need to focus our attention on. While also looking though at the industrial boglands and uh, some of those are going to have wind farms on them. Some of them are going to have um, 
with solar energy on them. It would be lovely to see um, a national peatland park in, in the Midlands uh, on some of this land. It, it would be lovely to see some of this land left for biodiversity um, and, and nature. Um, but IPCC don't own that land. All we can do is give our voices for peatland conservation and uh, recommendations on how best to uh, look at this industrial land from a uh, biodiversity point of view and a carbon point of view. Thanks, Mila. And um, the next question that has come in from Karina, uh, you mentioned plants and animals and bugs. What about bacteria and other smaller species? Has there been a study on soil health and biodiversity in bugs? Well, I know there's been many studies of invertebrates on boglands. So in terms of the spiders of boglands, and uh, as I mentioned, you're not really going to typically get snails on bogs because they're, um, or mollusks, I should say, because they're not, uh, they don't have the nutrients available for them. In terms of the soil bacteria, uh, again, we have to remember that boglands have a um, very high water table, so they have limited bacteria, but you will always generally get, um, you know, in the top kind of 10 to 20 centimetres, this kind of fluctuating oxygen uh, water table where oxygen will be um, present in that. I know a lot of pollen research has been done on boglands and um, that's how I suppose we know so much about their formation and the changes and because they're living history books we've been able to track the changes in pollen but I'm not familiar with studies on our you know taking a core and having a soil analysis on our peatlands but it's not to say that it hasn't happened or is not happening today in our universities but definitely interesting to learn because we know our soil health is so important it's uh, just because we don't see what's beneath the surface it doesn't mean that, that what's not there and I always say that to young people when we're going pond dipping you know they're all familiar with earthworms and spiders above the surface but they forget that beneath our water as well there's a diverse network of biodiversity as well to be found and that's no different with our soils. Um, thanks so much, uh, Nina. There's a couple of comments coming in uh, from folks who are talking about the tensions in, uh, in areas where people have traditionally used turf as fuel for domestic heating um, and you know, the restrictions that may come in to, um, on that cutting. Um, so, and then another person kind of had the same question and, and said, you know, what needs to happen to change people's minds about burning turf at home? I think it's interesting because I think we're all facing an energy crisis now. I think traditionally when we look at the cessation of turf cutting back in, you know, when it really started in the, I suppose, the 1998 when we signed the EU Habitats Directive and then we had the 10 year derogation and then, you know, really 2010 was the, the start of the cessation of turf cutting. and. Uh, families were compensated who could sign uh, who wanted to sign up for it so a number of families did sign up for the station and some cases families were relocated um, from these areas I think first off it's essential that we protect and conserve those areas that we have said we are going to protect remember these are the last examples that we have in our country and if we don't protect what we're saying we're going to protect we are not going to halt peatland biodiversity loss so this is that's the first thing in terms of then families that are affected absolutely families Families are going to be affected but if we look today I think whether you're in an urban area every family is going to be affected by our changing energy crisis we have signed into law our low carbon bill and our, our work towards our net zero economy by 2050 so over the next 30 years in Ireland we're going to see huge changes in the way we heat our homes in the way we our travel our movements you know in cars you know diesel and gas um, and I think it, it, it's really coming, going to come down to education, awareness, uh, supports in place for families to retrofit their homes uh, and not confining those supports either to, to families who might be affected by the turf cutting, uh, but also there's families in urban areas who will need to ret their, retrofit their homes as well. So I think uh, where traditionally we looked at it and said that it was a kind of, uh, I, we looked at it and said, okay, this is something that's happening only on our boglands. This has now become something that is going to affect every individual in this country uh, in terms of our energy crisis. And as we transition away from a, a net, uh, for, to a, a transition to, I should say, a net zero economy in that. So I think a, a real wider public look needs to be look at this uh, because ultimately everyone is going to have to alter the, the energy that we use uh, from our oil, from our gas, from our coal, and indeed our boglands. So um, again, 
I totally understand though that peatlands are very traditional to people and uh, we have and I don't I think if we look at it did a survey across how many people are watching uh, this zoom or participating many of us are family members who um probably know someone or are uh, burning peat. So it is a challenge, um, but uh, this is a change. This is going to be a change in our uh, behaviors and it's gonna be a change as well in our attitude. So this is where we have a strong government uh, departments coming together and looking at policy, a strong um, education and awareness program. And as I said, it, 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 it's something that every single citizen of Ireland is going to have to do if we are to strive for a net zero economy. Um, thanks, Muna. Um, another question has come in from cyclos.ie. Um, can you tell us more about the IPCC organization itself? So how you organize yourselves um, so as to do your advocacy work and a little bit about the mix of staff and volunteers. Thanks. Yeah, so um, so yes, yeah, so we're 40 years. We were set up in 82 and we're based today at the Bogavala Nature Centre. We are open to members of the public and we own and manage six uh, peatland reserves in our national network of reserves. We work in partnership with Waterford, the Moyne Fenoric Development Association in Gurley Bog. We purchased 8.5 hectares of that with uh, a number of stakeholders from local individuals to some state agencies owning that. We own part of uh, Kets Lock down in uh, um, County Clare, Code Bog in County um, Kerry, and I probably shouldn't have started to list them because I'm going to forget one of them. And then, uh, sorry, uh, Lodge Bog and Lullymore West in, in Kildare. So our work is, as I said, very diverse in terms of um, peatland uh, management, species monitoring. Uh, the Irish Peatland Conservation Council, we really work to take a lot of the information that's coming out of our universities. It can be very difficult to read an academic paper. So through our conservation ac action plan, what we do is we take all of this academic research and we place it into a, an action plan. Um, and that is user friendly, that no matter where you're from, you, you can understand where, where we're going with it. And the, all of us that our action plans are based on these scientific papers that, and reports that have been published. We are a small staff team of uh, four staff members. We're actually three at the moment, but we've just closed an application for a campaign officer. So fingers crossed, we'll have four very soon. Um, we uh, are guided by our volunteers, supported by volunteers. We have a fantastic network of volunteers. It's a fantastic to see when you say, hey, we're going to water level monitoring on the bog. How many people want to get involved? How many people will come out and help do our curlew monitoring, our butterfly monitoring, our bumblebee monitoring. Oh, it, it's amazing. A biodiversity surveys on Gurley Bog, volunteers below in, in Kerry doing uh, monitoring for us the whole time. And we're one of the first 15 country, uh, community groups in Ireland to receive a national volunteer friendly award. So we took part in the pilot initiative of that as well. And um, how we raise our, our funds is through sales of goods in our nature shop. You can become a friend of the bog. And um, you, uh, of course, I have to mention the Irish Environmental Network uh, and the supports that we get through the um, Irish Environmental Network. Uh, visitors uh, giving a donation, uh, stamps, we collect stamps and sell them to stamp dealers <laughs> around the world. So, um, but you can, what I'd suggest is uh, we are um, a registered charity with the charities regulator. So we, we uh, you know, try and have everything as transparent as possible. So rather than babbling on on everything, I will direct you to our website, ipcc.ie, where you can find all, all the information that you would need or indeed contact us at the Bog of Allen Nature Centre. Um, thanks so much. So we just have a, a, a couple more minutes uh, for final questions. Um, so a question from Connor. Um, a super presentation. My understanding is that Quilcha and Bordnamona are the largest peatland landowners. Picking up on your point of multiple government agencies, private landowners and NGOs, my question is, is there a national and or EU coordination body overseeing peatland restoration and rewetting um, and plans to enhance biodiversity or is everyone kind of working on this in silence? Yeah, so in terms of kind of a national look, we do have a national peatland strategy in Ireland, and that was developed as part of a cessation of turf cutting. So we do have a group in Ireland called the Peatlands Council, and the Peatlands Council was set up. It's uh, it's kind of managed from the, um, the Peatlands Management Unit of the National Parks and Wildlife Service. So we do have a specific peatland uh, group, uh, you know, unit within our National Parks and Wildlife Service, which is also very positive. But the Peatlands Council, what it does is it brings stakeholders stakeholders uh, together from all different 
excuse me, all different areas of our society. So we have our NGOs and IPCC would be represented on it. But you also have then the other stakeholders like the MPWS, Quilcha, Board Namona uh, that come together. Uh, the turf cutters and tractors are, are welcome to be part of it, but they have, uh, they have I think, stepped away from it. It's pre my time being on the council. So I don't know uh, the details of that, but uh, there, we do have that peatland council and we do have a national peatland strategy um, to, to work and to guide us. And there was a review of that in 20. 2021 just last year to see where we were with the strategy so it's we're not starting from a kind of a, 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 you know just a kind of off the block we do have supports in place but could we do more for peatland biodiversity the answer is yes on a national level we can um, and you know we need to look at as i said decisions that are being made in different departments and um, you know in terms of forestry on peatlands and um, you know one of the challenges that landowners who have planted forestry uh, was traditionally that if you plant forestry you have to replant when you fell that forestry now i do understand that is changing under the forestry act that you will no longer be required to plant on peatlands um but these changes have to have to come in and to, to look at peatlands a, as a whole um but in terms of an eu uh, level in terms of peatlands um i'm not too sure there is the international peatland society um the, this is um a governing now it does again bring peat producers together it has a, you know for example the Irish Peatland Society, we have uh, representatives from the, the national parks, NGOs, the horticultural industry, the energy industry, the Quilcher, the Board and the Monas, all of these different groups. Um, so we have that uh, as well. But uh, And then, of course, we have our habitats, EU habitats directive and that. But I think in an EU level, I'm not familiar at the moment or I'm just not thinking of it at the moment of a, of a peatland group. Okay, thanks, Lula. And the, the final question uh, from Louis Heath is, um, is it worth buying a few acres of bog to restore? And is there any help available for this? Yeah, so we have to remember boglands are uh, what we'd say is a hydrological unit. Um, so you could buy um, an old strip of turbary or that, but what you do on that strip of land is really going to be impacted by what's happening around you. Uh, you can't just take kind of a small section of a bog and say, okay, I'll restore this and let everything happen around it. And that's not going to work because it is a hydrological unit. So we have to look at the site as, as a whole, as an, as an entity. We're really going to really make a difference in terms of the hydrology and the restoration or the rehabilitation that we're going to do there. So in terms of site purchase, one of the things that the Irish Peatland Conservation Council do is we have a symbolic share in Irish peatland. So I spoke to you earlier on about how we have purchased peatlands. And the last one was in 2021, trans, uh, the Transition Mire, one of the best examples that are remaining in this country. Uh, and we purchased that through our symbolic share program. This fund is restricted in um, the Irish peatland conservation accounts and can only be used for site conservation and purchase. So how we use that is we only step in where it's needed. We're not a, a charity that are out there buying up bogs left, right and center. That's not what we want. But what we do is we step in. So our very first First one was the uh, Fenner Bog in County Waterford. The, it sat in the village, it came up for sale and the community were concerned that as a kind of a, a fen, it was potentially going to be drained and built on and, or used for agricultural land. So they came together, they were able to raise some funds, but they didn't have enough. And they found the Irish Peatland Conservation Council. And what we did was we were able to give them the funds to buy the bog in County Waterford. And still today, the Moyne for Newark Development Association are in Fenner Village, managing Fenner Bog. It sits in their community as it has for thousands of years before. Before. Um, and again, Gurley Bog, we don't own all of the bog, we just bought a section of it. And the section was really the last turf cutter wanted to sell. Uh, there wasn't funding there from a national perspective, but the IPCC could go in along with the Native Woodland Trust in this particular site. And together we conserved uh, that by, by our purchases together, uh, we were able to ensure that the, um, that the site was conserved and we were purchasing really the last turf cutter from the site. Um, so it, it's not just as easy as buying an acre of bog um, because it's really about the hyd hydrology of that site if we're going to if we're going to restore us. Um, thanks, Lula. I think so. Uh, thanks so much, Lula, for sharing your knowledge and and passion with everyone. And that was the the last question uh, that has come in on the chat. There's lots of conversation on the chat and people um, sharing email addresses and resources, which is fantastic. Um, I've also just shared a link to um, our 
the IEN's website uh, to our resource page on the Citizens Assembly and Biodiversity Loss. And the reason we're sharing that um, is to encourage everyone today to go ahead and make a submission. It doesn't have to be um, long or overly complex, but what we'd like, um, we, we want the Citizens Assembly folks to hear from us about why we need to protect our box. And then they will make a series of recommendations to government, which we are hoping will be as robust as possible. Um, so thanks so much everyone for, uh, for coming today and a uh, very special thanks to Nula um, for, for such a wonderful and stimulating talk. I hope everyone will be able to join us next week as we hear Una Duggan um, talk about farming and biodiversity. Um, I'll go ahead and share the link uh, to the Eventbrite uh, registration details in case you haven't signed up yet. And again, we will be, we have recorded this session and we'll be putting it up on our YouTube uh, channel shortly. But thank you again for, for your time this afternoon and very special thanks to Nula. Um, that was a wonderful talk. <laughs>